So thank you, Gracie. Um, so I'm just catching my breath from being really travel weary. I just got off of a plane. So I'm gonna try to get through a lot of, okay, I'm gonna try to get through a lot of information. Um, and so I'm gonna bounce around, use some really broad ideas, paint with some really broad strokes, and then Victoria is gonna clean it up and make sense of everything that I'm gonna speak about. So let's just, get into a project that me and Victoria have been working on for the past four years that has lineage, lineages and um, roots in, in deeper movements than, than just this. But we're, we've been working on a project called Design Justice Network. Um, and so I wanted to quote Sasha Costanza uh, Chalk, who is one of our committee members of the Design Justice Network. And they say design justice is a field of theory and practice that is concerned with how the design and technological objects and systems influence the distribution of risk, harms, and benefits among various groups of people. Design justice focuses on the ways that design reproduces and is reproduced by and or challenges the matrix of domination, i.e. white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, heteropatriarchy, ableism, capitalism, and settler colonialism. Design justice is also a growing community of practice that aims to ensure a more equitable distribution of design's benefits and burdens, fair and meaningful participation in design decisions, and recognition of, of community-based design traditions, knowledges, and practices. And so this dovetails or connects really closely with what um, Nadia was just speaking to um, in the goals and the aims of some of those projects. So going on, um, so there's a couple words that I just wanted to bring up as that are really important to this idea of design justice. First is intersectionality. So intersectionality, if you go to the next slide, was started by Kimberly Crim Crenshaw in her scholarship. And so, just to read this, when feminism does not explicitly oppose racism, and when anti-racism does not incorporate opposition to patriarchy, race, and gender politics, often end up being antagonistic to each other, and both interests lose. So essentially what we're saying is, single slogan, sling, single um, issue politics or movements don't necessarily work, right? When you simplify issues, when you try to move forward, when you try to become empirical with a movement, then that actually puts pits movements against each other. So it recognizes multiple roots, the complexity of systems of oppression on people, on groups, on bodies, and then brings them all together and acknowledges those things and understands how they can work together in, um, Casting off, of the, casting off this oppression. So we go to the next one. So this is just a chart that is a basic chart that addresses what is called the matrix and the matrices of oppression. And so we don't have to get really deeply into this, but this is what Kimberly Crenshaw really gets into. But what is really essential about this is design justice bases its roots in these ideas, intersectionality, um, this idea of justice and justice not being approachable or achievable without understanding root causes or inter intersectionality. So, design justice moves closer towards participatory design approaches, which happened and started way before um, we came together and started thinking about these ideas. And so, just keep going, We're just, these are things that we move towards. Um, design justice asks, who made the rules of design, which is really essential? Who was left out when the rules were made? Who gets to make the rules for the future? Which rules do we leave behind? What's obsolete? Um, all assumptions about design practice and design history should be questioned. Um, and so those are essential. So just using this, um, Paul Rand, who is you know this revered designer, 
especially in the States, design like the IBM logo, like a lot of understanding, like a lot of our understanding of like modernist design, right? Should this guy just go? Should we just stop revering this to move forward with new ideas? What are we holding on to when we can say, Paul Rand did his thing, it's not even relevant or obsolete? Why are we holding on ideas from the 30s and 50s and 60s um, when we're trying to understand new approaches? And these are questions, right? So here are some things that design justice moves away from or questions very deeply. So this idea of design thinking, um, and I'm not gonna get too deeply into that right now because we have a lot of ground to cover, um, and not to say that any of these ideas are inherently bad, but there's some things missing when we talk about these, these things. Human-centered design, um, design for good, um, and this idea of social practice, which are all pretty much big things in the US, but a lot of them do not take into account these ideas of intersectionality. They actually do not have a justice approach to them when you actually go to the core of these ideas. Um, one thing that I would challenge with this idea of human-centered design is it's actually just a way to sell things more efficiently to people, right? But it has a nomenclature that might seem like it is um, in the interest of people, right? But I would challenge that it is actually not. Um, so, Design Justice Coalition builds on lineages mostly coming from Detroit and Detroit movements, um, southern eastern, southeastern Michigan. And so it also, one second, I'll do, um, coming from the Allied Media Conference. So there's this thing that we are been, we've been a part of that is part of like many radical organizers that deal with a lot of different topics. So the Allied Media Conference is this convening every summer, almost every summer in Detroit, that challenges the idea of media and what is design or what are creative practices. So you can self-organize a convening of people, whether it be workshops, whether it be, I would say, presentations, but it's mostly hands-on. Like that is the, the goal is like, when you present, you just don't do panel topics, you actually do workshop. Um, but you can organize around some of the most obscure things or some of the most like really succinct things. So you could have um, femme queer librarians that all have this small group or have this small community that they want to convene in Detroit. And so they could also um, be like, I don't know, like femme queer, sex worker librarians, right? And so they can be, become really specific, but these they have networks and communities that they can convene and be expressive and feel like they have the space to um, put out their ideas. So Design Justice Coalition comes out of this idea of um, Design, D Detroit Digital Coalition, which started at the AMC. One of our co-committee um, members uh, Una Lee started this idea of consentful tech, and consentful tech is a whole zine, is a whole community, something that people should check out for sure. And then deeper lineages of movement, organizing, and activism. So Grace Lee Boggs, Jimmy Boggs are um, essential figures in Detroit organizing, um, national organizing when you talk about the U.S., um, they go back to um, interpreting Marxist texts uh, to being really influential in the Black Panther movement. So Grace Lee Boggs, who died at 100 years and 100 days, actually, um, has been involved with movements for the whole century and just recently um, joined the ancestors. So I think, is that my last one? Okay, cool. So I'm gonna hand it over to Victoria. Well done. I have to I have to wear this thing. Yeah, I got you. Is it okay? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so hi, I'm Victoria. Um, I'm based in Toronto. I'm a settler living in Toronto, um, so Ontario, Canada, in case you didn't know. Um, I can click, yeah, it's okay. Um, okay, yeah, sure, sure. Um, and so Wes gave you a lot of the frameworks on which uh, design justice is based, and now I'll talk about how um, we developed the principles of design justice, as well as the network of people that exist and a little bit about how it works. Um, so this picture here that you see is actually from um, a workshop that was held in 2015 at the Allied Media Conference, which Wes spoke about. Um, it was called Co-Generating Principles for Design Justice. Um, and what happened in that meeting was pe people uh, brainstormed and came up with ideas around design justice based on those ideas, what, what Wes spoke about, social impact, um, design for good, um, and talked about the challenges or challenging those, those notions, um, and looked at some projects that existed in Detroit at the time that um, that were called design for good or social innovation. Um, I'll talk about that again in a, in a second, um, but I'll, just, I'll no, no, yeah, I'll, I'll speak to this slide too. So when when we are talking about design justice, um, I know Wes spoke to it a little bit, but to explain it a little bit further, when um, thinking about design. Um, I, another way to look at it is what is design injustice? So what is done without justice in mind? Um, and an, an example I can think of is any sort of technological device that we hold in our hands right now today. Um, if I think of Apple as a tech company, um, and then we think about the new iPad or the new iPhone that they're developing, probably 6S, G4, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, just a new piece of technology. Um, and when we're thinking about who would be benefiting or who would be um, harmed in the process of creating a new iPhone, um, what you would see are uh, the benefits um, on the left-hand side here um, most often go to those with the most power. Um, and as an example, that would be the CEO of the company or the UX and UI designers who are creating the devices, the people who have the money in order to buy or pay for that phone, um, and the people who are not benefiting, that, that are less in power, are those who are the ones working in the mines, digging the, 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 the what are they called, resources that will become the batteries that go into the phones, or the people who are not able to purchase and use those phones, the people who cannot, uh, the, the people that when we're using our phones and we know that languages don't transfer, the people who are most dominantly made, or these phones are made for are probably white men. <laughs> um, those are the people who are often thinking about that process. Um, and so those who are most harmed are the, the people who I mentioned and those who are not being harmed as much by that process are the ones in the power. Um, so this is just a picture of some of those of us um, iterating over the design justice principles, which now um, I'll show you about design. So in terms of a design process, um, on, the, on the left side, um, that would be what we look at as a conventional design process. And the pink or the CN colored dots are those who are the ones with more power inside of that design process. And the green or, um, yeah, the green dots are the ones outside of the process, those with less power who are not able to participate, who are not even asked to participate. Um, and when we're looking and talking about design justice, we are talking about centering those who are most impacted. So those people working in the mine, the people who cannot afford the phones, the people who wouldn't have access to that um, process are centered in that design justice process. And that's what we were talking about. So now I'll speak to the, the design justice principles. That's the link. And we developed 10 principles in that session 
um, starting in 2015, but over, over a couple of years, they kind of evolved and became uh, the 10 design justice principles that exist now. Um, and so in terms of the network, um, we explained a little bit of the history, but um, I think we can go to the next one. <laughs> um, these are just some pictures of the various years of um, meetups mostly that would happen in Detroit, but also happen online and digitally, um, where we talked about the principles that were made at that session, reiterated, edited, changed them, um, to become the 10 that exist today. And I will say that those principles can evolve and should evolve as time changes, as issues change, as pieces of the world will change. Um, they're, they're iterate, exactly, as we get feedback, um, they can and should change. Um, this is a picture of some of the zines that we have. They're all on the designjusticenetwork.org website. You can check them out later. Um, I think I'm missing something. <laughs> I guess I've done everything. Um, but so in terms of the, the design justice network as it exists now, here's a very rough uh, sketch of what it looks like. Um, everybody who you can see on here, a steering committee, signatories, volunteers and participants and local nodes. So the network has been growing. Um, the way it exists now is non-hierarchical. That's why everybody's in a circle, so everybody's on the same level. Um, steering committee folks are Wes and I, and Yuna, Lee, and Sasha, um, folks who've been around and involved for a very long time. We're, our goal is to help create space for the network to grow. Um, so this weekend, or this next couple days, we're here to work with the Design Justice Mediterranean folks to help get some st stuff started, bring some inspiration from what we've done. Um, people who are signatories are people who've signed on to the Design Justice Principles, which you'll see in a second. Um, volunteers and participants, there's people doing work or quoting the Design Justice Principles or using them, and they are volunteering and participating all the time, even you in this room. <laughs> and uh, local nodes are, um, in, in each, in various cities or various countries, people are organizing their own design justice meetup um, where they're talking about the principles, how to make those principles work in action. Um, and I am based in Toronto, so we have a local node there. We're going to be talking about the Mediterranean node or group or meetup. Um, and so they're really growing and um, changing how many people know about the principles. Um, I'm going to skip this one. And this is where you can see um, where you could go to sign on to be a member. I think that I'm using old slides. Ignore, ignore. Okay. So this is where you can go to, to see the principles um, and sign on. I'll show you again at the end. So um, now I'll just give you a quick example of where you can see the design justice, design justice principles in action. Um, one quick case study, which is what I'll show you, is Consentful Tech. Wes mentioned that. And another really good resource that we have is in our second zine. Um, we exhibit different projects that have happened that either used or were criticized um, under the framework of design justice, and there were conversations that you can read a little bit about. So, um, Consentful Tech, so a lot of times people will ask us like, well, how do we use the principles, or who is using them, or where do we find a, a project that's doing that? Um, and this, given it's the Internet Festival, I hope is useful for folks that the Consentful Tech zine, Yuna Lee, um, one of our steering committee members um, got this project initiated with her team. Um, and what consentful tech is, is cons uh, technical consent from the ground up. It comes from, oh, there's another one missing, but I'll show you this one anyways. Um, the idea around consentful tech came out of the um, Elizabeth Fry, Elizabeth, now I've forgotten the name, but the basic principles are here. that. Tech and any kind of consent um, should be freely given, reversible, informed, 
enthusiastic and specific. And it came out of Planned Parenthood. That was the, the name I was looking for. Um, and so what the Consentful Tech Zine does, yes, okay, um, is look at any new tech that's being built up and talking about how um, it needs to be from the ground up built with consent. So are people freely giving us their consent um, to access and store parts of their digital bodies? Does our system allow for reversible consent? Um, how are we fully and clearly informing people of what they are actually consenting to. So I think so, some of what Nadia was talking about in terms of technical things, how do we make more inclusive, how do we make them more um, consentful, um, this is a very good resource that people could look at and use. Um, a couple weeks ago in Toronto, there was also some folks that came and spoke about um, the tech workers, tech workers co-op, I think it's called? Tech Workers Union, um, but they they spoke about how do we create tech when we're working in the tech field? How do we create uh, spaces that allow for that consent? Or what do we do when our employer or people that we are working with are not doing this? And there are many amazing examples of people rising up and resisting um, technical um, issues like this, but. Um, overall, when, I, when we think about consentful tech and design justice and the principles, um, these are four of the ten principles that exist that are used in this project. Um, I was saying to Elena that sometimes it's very hard to actually use all ten of the principles in the work that you're doing because there are ten of them, there are a lot. But the idea is to use them as a framework for the work that you're doing and then implement them as best as you can throughout that work. And of course, always be, um, what's the word, like revising and rethinking about your processes. So if you're going to step B and you realize, oh, we missed a lot of this important stuff, it's okay to go back. I know in a workplace setting, that doesn't always get the opportunity, but it's okay to go back, it's okay to reflect, it's okay to change your process and use um, these principles as needed. I can read them, yes. So we use design to sustain, heal, and empower our communities, as well as seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. We pri prioritize design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer. We share design knowledge and tools with our communities, and we work towards sustainable, community-led and controlled outcomes. I had one with all 10, but I think I lost it somewhere. Um, so just to wrap up, um, uh, the, the link for the Consentful Tech is there, and you can download the zine, which gives you many, many resources. And we also have our slides there if you want to download them and read them later. <laughs>